Welcome to part 3 of my series on how I made these photorealistic 3D Desmos fractals. This builds on part 2 and part 1, so check this out if you haven't already. It's been a tough journey so far. You've trudged through the raymarching algorithm, had to listen to me ramble on and on about reflections and lighting, committed unspeakable atrocities against the field of computer graphics, and so much more. And now we've finally reached the light at the end of the tunnel. We get to make 3D fractals. Now, as I hope I made clear in part 1, our 3D scene, which will eventually become a fractal, is defined by an SDF, or sine distance function. As a quick recap, the SDF is a function of a 3D point, and it returns the shortest distance from that 3D point to the surface of a scene. Now, on the surface, that seems like a very difficult restriction to crack. How do we make such a function for something as complicated as a fractal? Well, we can't just pull a fractal out of thin air. Let's start with something simpler, a sphere. Consider a sphere of radius r centered at the origin. Here's the SDF for that. Simple, right? The part on the left is the distance to the origin. This part on the right decreases that distance so that it's equal to zero at precisely r units away from the origin, thus creating a sphere of radius r. Here's the SDF for a bond, rectangular prism, whatever, you know, these things. This one's a bit more complicated. I won't go into how it works in this video, however. Of course, these two shapes on their own are somewhat boring. Let's move them around. For example, consider the sphere of radius r centered at the point a, b, c. To do this, we need to subtract a from x, b from y, and c from z before we put these coordinates into the sphere SDF formula. Remember how the center of the sphere used to be the origin, 0, 0, 0? Well now if we try to plug in the position ABC, it gets ABC subtracted from it, giving us 0, 0, 0 when we put it into the SDF function. It's as if the sphere SDF sort of thinks it's at the origin, even though it was really at ABC. Thus the sphere is now centered at ABC. We can do a similar thing with a rectangular prism, and in fact with any SDF we use. If you want to translate your object to the point ABC, subtract each coordinate from the position before plugging that position into the SDF. Okay, but that's still kind of boring. We're still moving stuff around. Let's combine multiple objects together. A sphere centered at 0, 0, 0 of radius 1, and a sphere centered at 1, 0, 0 of radius 1. How do we represent this? Well, first we have to calculate the SDFs of both objects. I'll call these sine to distance 1 and sine to distance 2. Then, since all of our final SDF function cares about is the minimum distance from the point of the scene, we just pick whatever distance is lower and return that. This is one of the Boolean operations that we can use to combine objects in a variety of different ways. More specifically, this is the union operator, because it's like the union operator in set theory that joins sets together. See the resemblance? Here's another one called the intersection operator. As you might expect, it only produces a shape where both shapes overlap. As a consequence, the intersection of a sphere centered at 0, 0, 0 of radius 1 and a sphere centered at 1, 0, 0 of radius 1 produce this. This works very similar to Union, except we choose the maximum of the two SDFs instead of the minimum. Here's a way to intuitively think of this. The SDF of ne is negative inside the scene. The maximum function will be positive, i.e. outside the scene, if either individual SDF is positive. Therefore, the maximum of these two SDFs is negative if and only if both individual SDFs are negative. Therefore, a given position is inside the scene if and only if that position is inside of both objects. Thus, we get the intersection. Here's a simpler Boolean operator, negation. If we take an SDF and make it negative, it flips the inside and outside of the scene. Negative becomes positive, and positive becomes negative. We have one more Boolean operator to talk about, subtraction. Subtraction is where you basically carve out a hole in one object, except the hole is defined as another object. Here's the sphere at 0, 0, 0 of radius 1, with the sphere at 1, 0, 0 of radius 1 subtracted from it. Here's an interesting thing about subtraction, compare it with the intersection. The piece missing from the sphere at the origin is its intersection with the other sphere. This makes sense. With intersection, we were saying what points are in the first object and the second object. With subtraction, we're saying what points are in the first object and not the second object. I hope you realize now that we can define subtraction as intersection, i.e. the maximum of the SDFs, except the thing we're subtracting is negated. Thus, here's our formula for that. Okay, so that was Boolean operations. We have one more thing to talk about before we can actually make fractals. Repetition. There's a really neat trick here for getting an object to repeat. Let's try and render a sphere of radius 0.5, centered at 1, 1, 1. Except before we do all that stuff, let's set each coordinate to itself mod 2. This will make each coordinate repeat over the interval 0, 2 indefinitely, like so. This has the consequence of making the coordinates repeat over the region containing the sphere over and over and over again. This results in an infinite grid of spheres. Now we're ready to create the fractal. Here's how I made this fractal. Start it with a sphere. Now make an infinite grid of cubes using the method I used above, and then subtract that from the sphere. This is what you'll get. Now take that, and subtract another grid of cubes from it, except make the cubes half the size and half the distance apart. Do that again, except make the cubes half the size and half the distance apart again. Repeat this process again. Repeat this process again and again and again. 
keep on doing this until your computer crashes. Anyway, upon doing this, you will have created your first fractal. No, 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 not the sword from Terraria, this fractal. You can do some cool things with this. Check out what happens if you subtract sphere grids instead of cube grids. Check out what happens if you don't use a factor of exactly one half to scale the grids. Pretty cool, right? Oh yeah, I hope this is already clear to you, but these fractals I'm showing you right now weren't made in Desmos. They use an engine I've created for this very purpose. You know how my Desmos engine took 19 hours to render a frame? This engine does that in real time, and with 100 times the pixels. Yeah. Check it out in the description, it runs in your browser. So that was 3D Fractals. But wait, the series isn't over yet! Even though we've reached the light at the end of the tunnel, there's another tunnel after the light, and this one is far spookier and scarier than this one. That's right, we're making the deep dive into dark, deadly demonstrations of Desmos, checking out all the freakishly fascinating features of this gorgeous green graphing calculator. In part 4, we'll be examining the obscure features that Desmos has, the ones that make it possible to make 3D Fractals, among other things. Until then, thanks for watching.